Monday night. Uh, this will be our only Monday night session, um, and uh, we're delighted that to see so many of you here uh, for this, uh, I think, very special presentation. Um, our speaker tonight, uh, in case you haven't made the connection, uh, was co-author um, of an op-ed piece in today's New York Times uh, that addresses uh, another set of issues which we'll uh, deal with next semester around cybersecurity. And uh, from my perspective as I read it, um, how technology can uh, distort the truth. Um, uh, but that's not what he's here to talk about tonight. Although I, I guess you can question him on that. Um, our next uh, class of the uh, uh, open classroom is a week from Wednesday. Um, we are starting to post in our announcements um, one reading a week um, at, uh, upon the request of uh, one of you who said, why don't you give us some readings too in case we want to look at those. Um, and so uh, you will see on this week's um, uh, announcement that there is a reading that was posted and you can read it after the fact of course um, and we will continue to do that for the balance of the semester. Um, we will not grade any papers that you write <laughs> uh, but we, we do encourage you to uh, uh, do the readings. Um, and then the matriculating students will be meeting in our regular time slot uh, on uh, Wednesday late afternoon. Um, with that, uh, I think we're done with announcements. Uh, Wendy Parment, you're on. Thank you, Ted. So when we were thinking about this topic, uh, lessons in 1968, political violence, threats to the rule of law, there was one person we really wanted to get, and we were so thrilled that, to have Rick Goldstein with us today. Um, so he is one of the leading historians of 20th century American conservatism and also, I guess, our hackable future. Um, his books include the New York Times bestseller, Nixon Land, The Rise of a President, The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan, and Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater and the Unmaking of the American Consensus. Um, he is a contributing writer to The Nation and former national correspondent for The Village Voice. He's been an online columnist for The New Republic, Rolling Stone, and his essays appear in many different publications, including today's New York Times um, and Newsweek. And he has even let on and told us that he will be on Morning Joe tomorrow morning. Um, so tune in. Um, although he did tell me he's not on Fox and Friends. Uh, he earned his BA in history from the University of Chicago and did his graduate work at the University of Michigan. It is a real thrill uh, to have him with us tonight. As usual, we will begin with a clip. Uh, hopefully, all is working audiovisual wise, and uh, then Rick will talk and then we will open it up for questioning. Uh, I've been asked to explain the lessons of 1968, and not for the first time, because I did write a book about the 1960s and the rise of Richard Nixon, called Nixon Land. Uh, so on this, the 50th anniversary of the 69th year of the, 29th, uh, of the uh, 20th century, my phone quite frequently rings off the hook with requests with, from uh, public radio producers, political reporters, magazine editors, university lecture series. Uh, and I've always found these invitations a little bit uncomfortable uh, because, strangely enough, I never thought that 1968 was the biggest deal when it comes to the 1960s. Uh, it, but it's always 1968 that people want to talk about. Um, so I, you know, sigh and shrug and do my best. Uh, this time, however, it's a little different. Uh, it's an honor to speak at such a well-conceived lecture series, and when I sat down to work on these remarks, uh, I found myself digging <coughs> deeper. Uh, I found myself in meta-territory, and I ended up with, a, I think, an important insight. I studied the American political soul. I'm a historian, 
<laughs> and the first and most important job requirement is to start with the evidence. So here's some evidence. Uh, on Amazon.com, six separate books whose titles are simply 1968. Uh, on the Internet Movie Database, 16 films, TV movies, or TV episodes called simply 1968. Any number of magazine articles, most recently a mammoth New Yorker essay by uh, Louis Manand that ran to almost 6,000 words. Any number of lectures, which now include this one. <laughs> That's how I realized it's not my job to decide which was the most important year of the decade of cataclysms that we call the 1960s. My research subjects, you, have already decided. What took place between January 1st, 1968 and December 31st, 1968 uh, was something Americans found so soul-searing that they cannot stop talking about it, thinking about it, hearing about it, reading about it. So my question becomes, why? Was it the 1968 election? Uh, well, uh, 1960 and 1964 were pretty darn interesting. I wrote a whole book about the 1964 election. Uh, was it the riots? Well, in 1967, the riots were, in a lot of ways, just as bad. Was it the student rebellion? Uh, in 1969 and 1970, college protests were far more dramatic, far more violent. Uh, the People's Party <coughs> protest in 1969 in Berkeley uh, was the first, first but not the last to involve tanks and military helicopters. In 19, by, 1960, by 1970, students were burning down university buildings quite frequently. Four died in Ohio. And three quarters of the universities in the United States shut down in strikes uh, following the shooting in Kent State in May of 1970. Um, was it the music? Well, you know, every year in the 60s had great music. Um, so what set 68 apart? Uh, this invitation from the Myra Craft Open Classroom series helped me in this work of interpretation because I have been asked to explore, quote, the definition of the rule of law, what it requires, and what happens in its absence. And when, re when I read that, I immediately began to think about, in the context of the 1960s, November 22nd, 1963, which I think is the day the cataclysms of the 1960s really began. Uh, that's the date of the Kennedy assassination, which in my book, Before the Storm, I called the day the bottom dropped out of the United States of America. One favorite piece of evidence I've always held on to in measuring precisely how traumatic that day was was that in a poll, 50% of American men were called crying that day. Emotions, of course, have a history as well. And in 1963, men generally did not cry. And they certainly did not admit to strangers that they cried. But after Kennedy's assassination, they could not but admit they cried. Think of Don Draper in Mad Men crying in 1963. He cries by the end, but that's because the 60s happened. <laughs> and what was precisely so traumatic about John F. Kennedy's death? So this is an argument. He was a beloved figure, of course, but honestly, not really that beloved, uh, certainly not as beloved as we remember him. The 1960 election was practically a tie. The cover of Look Magazine shortly before his death read JFK could lose in 1964. He passed practically no legislation, although almost immediately after his death, uh, the legislation he himself had failed to pass, including the 1964 Civil Rights Act, became law and a veritable torrent because Congress was willing to do just anything, just about anything to honor this martyr. But what was he a martyr to? Why did half of American men cry? What was so crushing about his death? Ultimately, I think it was the thought of assassination determining the course of American politics. Assassination. Assassination, which is the opposite of democracy, the opposite of the democratic form of government, the bluntest imaginable negation of government by the people, of the people, and for the people. Government by gunplay, 
to cite one of the hundreds of books about the JFK assassination. A young journalist, Hunter S. Thompson, wrote to a friend, the savage nuts have destroyed the myth of American decency. For it was the rest of the world that practiced government by gunplay. The savage wars of religion that followed the Protestant Reformation, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand that set off the powder keg of World War I, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, the fascisms that blighted Europe, the banana republics of South and Central America, the assassination of No Ngo Dinh Diem of South Vietnam the previous October. America was the world's respite from government like that. Our city on a hill, Americans imagined, was ruled by law, not violence. Now, of course, this is in many ways a myth, but there is nothing more American than the act of dismissing the ways our institutions and ways of being have been structured by violence. In America, when the rule of law breaks down and violence breaks out, the civic instinct, especially among the guardians of elite opinion, is always to class it as an exception, as not really American. And here, finally, we come to what makes 1968 different from all the other years in our collective historical imagination. It is that this was the year, and we see that in this video, uh, when government faked by gunplay uh, in the form of the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy, only two months apart, allowed it no longer to a class, America, uh, class violence as an exception to America. It came to be, to seem simply part of the natural order of things, the main event, something that might not ever stop a chilling recognition that perhaps this was what we were. I put the cover of Time Magazine from June 21st, 1968, following JFK, RFK's assassination up there. That same week, Newsweek asked, has, a vi has violence become an American way of life? A Philadelphia Inquirer columnist wrote, the country does not work anymore. All that money and power have produced has been a bunch of people so filled with fear and hate that when a man uh, tries to tell them that they must do more for other men, instead of listening, they shoot him in the head. That fear that there would be no law was the terror suffusing everything. It was the terror that defined the experience and the memory of 1968. And it was through that prism that I reread the parts of my own book covering 1968, and I began to see it everywhere in those days and weeks and months. The breakdown of law as premonition, as experience, as reflection. Start with the Tet Offensive in the Vietnam War. We uh, received a great introduction to that. But I'm going to start back further in 1788, when the chartering document for American law was ratified, Article 1, Section 8, granting only to Congress the power to declare war. From the beginning, of course, uh, this was a power frequently honored in the breach. Uh, war has been declared by Congress 11 times. Uh, only three of those did not involve countries associated with World War I or World War II. And on the other hand, Wikipedia has a page called Timeline of United States Military Operations. I didn't have time to count them all, but uh, to give you some rough sense, there were 14 listed for the decade of 1810 to 1819, uh, and 23 from 2010 to the present. So it's not like we don't have a military. Uh, it's, not like, uh, it's, it's not like we don't go to war, but we don't frequently declare war. The fact is, though, the vast, vast percentage of those engagements were very, very minor. Enough so that before Vietnam, Americans could at least convince themselves that America's founding legal charter had at least been formally respected. Even the Korea War, Korean War, in which some 37,000 Americans died, uh, compared to 55,000 for Vietnam, in which President, Eiser, uh, President Eisenhower uh, un unfortunately termed a police action, at least had the sanction of the United States. United Nations. It had the color of law. Vietnam never had anything close. The opposite. The outstanding recent film, The Post, which I highly recommend, 
about the Pentagon Papers, does an outstanding job of making plain some of the most glaring ways America, American presidents and their janissaries broke faith with the spirit of the Constitution, such as sabotaging the reunification election in 1954 in Vietnam because our side wasn't going to win, or 1964 what became known as the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which had been written for congressional authorization months before the Gulf of Tonkin incident that LBJ lied about in order to sell a pretext to escalate our involvement in Vietnam. The escalation to ground troops happened the next year, 1965, in supposed response to an enemy attack at the Marine base in Pleiku. Uh, a reporter in Washington asked George Bundy, the uh, American defense official, why is Pleiku the reason we have to put troops on the, the ground, land Marines in Vietnam? What about all these other attacks? What about attacks in the future? But George Bundy said, Pleikus are like streetcars, meaning if there wasn't one, there would be one soon. He was admitting this is just a pretext. We're not actually telling the American people why we go to war. We're using this attack as a uh, alibi. And these originary acts of breaking faith became licensed. Once the originary big lie was ventured, once the rule of law was radically sundered, an infinite number of both greater and lesser lies could and did follow. No law, no truth, no truth. And by 1968, the basic trust Americans had in their leaders began a historic sundering. Tet was the watershed. Here's how I put it in Nixon land, writing about the fall of 1968. General Westmoreland, he was the commander of American forces in Vietnam, told the National Press Club, we have got our opponents along the ropes. The end begins to come into view. There was light at the end of the tunnel. Time magazine, uh, which millions of Americans read every week as gospel, argued victory was imminent again and again on November 17th. So wide-ranging as Allied surveillance, a few safe spots remained to the communists in South Vietnam. November 24th. Slow but promising tangible progress. Viet Cong recruitment, running last year at a rate of some 7,500 per month, has now dropped to 3,500. December 8th, in recent weeks in South Vietnam, communist troops have been regularly beaten back, hurled from prepared positions, put to flight, and slaughtered in huge numbers. December 29th, even by the Jovian standards of Operation Rolling Thunder, the code name for the air war against North Vietnam, it was a spectacular performance the most devastating six days of the air war. January 5th, 1968, Time Magazine headlined an article, Arvin, that's the South Vietnamese Army, toward fighting trim. On January 12th, quote, administration officials long convinced that there is no realistic hope of peace negotiations until after the 1968 elections, if then, were admitting last week they may have been too pessimistic. The Tet Offensive follows a couple weeks later, so I can skip that part. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. Um, the subject I next turn to chronologically in Nixon land is the political consequences of Pet for the 1968 presidential election, specifically the extraordinary melodrama that unfolded within the Democratic Party. Uh, that was kind of hinted at there, but one name uh, that didn't make it up onto the screen was Eugene McCarthy. Uh, it began as the impossible dream of a group of liberal activists. They sought to unseat Lyndon Johnson as the 1968 Democratic nominee. It end up, ended up as a reality. The name for the political tendency that unseated Lyndon Johnson was the New Politics, capital N, capital T. And the important thing to understand about it in context in the context of the historical changes wrought by 1968, was that the new politics keynote, the thing that made it new, was a commitment to radical truth. The idea that politic, the politics that led to the tragedy in Vietnam uh, uh, was because America's political culture was saturated with dishonesty. I would comment that you know, usually people are like, oh, well, there's always a little you know, dishonesty in politics, right? The thing that made the new politics new was, let's have a politics that's all about organic truth, authenticity, not that backroom stuff. I write about a debate within the liberal group, Americans for Democratic Action. 
between an older faction who saw holding the line in Vietnam as honoring liberalism's founding principle of fighting tyranny, in this case, communist tyranny, in the spirit of Winston Churchill fighting off the forces of Neville Chamberlain in 1930s England, and a younger faction led by an activist named Allard Lowenstein, the leader of the Dump Johnson movement. Um, Arthur Schlesinger and Kenneth Galbraith, they were both famous liberal professors, uh, both, both of whom at Harvard, formulated a compromise that carried the meeting of the Americans for Democratic Action. They would advocate for an anti-war plank in the Democratic Convention instead of the divisive distraction of taking on the power of the presidency. Allard Lowenstein didn't sign on. He couldn't imagine how a movement of liberal ideas could countenance a colonial war. He couldn't understand how anyone saw a political future for the Democrats behind a war and a leader less popular by the day. He didn't understand how the Democrats could stake their fortune on the old way of doing things. Governors broking, brokering presidential nominations in back rooms. In a world where everything worthwhile was new, where all authenticity and truth concentrated on the side of idealism, of revolt, of anti-colonialism, of youth, he spoke for a new Democratic Party move. The idea that the insurgencies of the 1960s had rendered the old rules of power obsolete. One cannot speak of black power or the riots or even Vietnam in a, in a, in a compartmentalized vacuum, the liberal journalist Jack Newfield wrote in The Village Voice. They are all part of something larger. We have permitted political power in America to pass from the people to a technological elite. Representative democracy has broken down. People such as Allard Lowenstein and Jack Newfield called their movement the New Politics. It was defined by disgust at the, at, at the business as usual political dances of the old politicians in a time of moral enormity. If we have LBJ for another four years, there won't be much of a country left, another young New York writer, Pete Hamill, wrote in a letter to Bobby Kennedy. And the Democrats will be a party that says to millions and millions of people that they don't count, and the decisions of 2,000 political hacks does. Uh, foot soldiers of the Dump Johnson movement were mostly students. They knocked on doors, armed with idealism and intellectual arguments. What they were not armed with as 1968 approach was a candidate. The new politics was flavored Kennedy. Everyone knew it. He's a happening, was how the title of a 1966 profile of Bobby Kennedy in the New Republic put it. Uh, the article luxuriated over Kennedy's passion for sudden, spontaneous, half-understood acts of calculated risk, his denouncing of easy solutions. Even more, he seems to dislike solutions in general. Kennedy was always searching for new frontiers of meeting. Uh, the Happening released a book that fall, the kind that presidential aspirants put out before announcing their campaigns. The first chapter of To Seek a Newer World was entitled Youth, and spoke of the white power structure, the establishment, the Watts riot, as a revolt against official indifference. He's almost saying that it's kind of okay, or at least understandable, that black people are burning down buildings because the establishment is corrupt. This new politics was, uh, this Bobby Kennedy was new politics made flesh. I go on and on about why Bobby Kennedy dithered about the idea of running for president, taking on an incumbent president in his own party. He was also kind of a practical guy. Uh, he had ties to the old politics. Lowenstein searched desperately for a second option. All the best anti-war senators had re-election fights in 1968. Senator Fulbright, the Dove Chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, who spoke of, quote, how the war in Vietnam is poisoning and brutalizing our domestic life, was a Southerner who voted down the line against desegregation. Lowenstein wrote them all letters nonetheless, begging them to stand in the gap. Only Eugene McCarthy, a diffident, difficult senator from Minnesota, expressed any interest. 
he proposed a meeting later in the year. The prospect hardly inspired them. McCarthy was an odd duck. The small town Minnesota native who turned himself into an intellectual at a tiny Catholic college had once considered entering the priesthood, even a monastery. When Richard Nixon entered the House of Representatives, he started a fight up club for freshman Republicans. Uh, he gave them the Hail Fellow Well Met moniker, the Chowder and Marching Club. Uh, when Eugene McCarthy pulled together a like minded cadre of young Midwestern liberals, he called it the Democratic Study Group. McCarthy liked to study. He wrote poetry in his spare time difficult, modern stuff inspired by Wallace Stevens and William Carlos Williams. Not the sort of guy you'd pick for a street fight with LBJ. But he decided to run. And lo and behold, in this very strange year, in which because the rule of law seemed to be breaking down, honesty, authenticity became a fetish, he started to do well. College students, housewives, celebrities swarmed New Hampshire to volunteer for Eugene McCarthy. Capitol Hill staffers packed their bags to work for him with the words ringing in their ears that they never work in Washington again. The polls gave the aloof Minnesotan 11%, which seemed about right. He seemed like a nice enough man, one grand saint matron who met him in a shopping center said, though she couldn't quite remember his name. But McCarthy counted his lack of charisma as a virtue. He refused to mention he was Catholic, though New Hampshire was 40% Catholic. He didn't care what others thought about him. But that might have been one of his strengths in 1968. It's amazing how easily the average politician can be intimidated, not Eugene McCarthy. In 1952, he went on national TV to de debate that other McCarthy, Joseph, the senator from Wisconsin, who hoped that liberals like Eugene were the reason we no longer have China. The dry-witted former professor fearlessly came back it's not our policy to have people. Still, the kids flocked to New Hampshire to work for him. It had been a risky strategy to encourage them. When many middle-aged Americans thought of anti-war youth, they pictured smelly hippies trying to levitate the Pentagon. By the way, that, 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 that uh, Pentagon um, protest that you saw the video of, uh, a bunch of hippies said they were going to have a seance and levitate the Pentagon. That was in 1967. Uh, the shrewd McCarthy manager who took, the, took on the college volunteers made them shave their beards, eschew miniskirts, and segregated them by sex. It was called coming clean for Jean. <laughs> uh, let's see here. The White House rushed a rear guard action to face safe, safe base for the president of New Hampshire. It had seemed a little too desperate for a man who had won one of the greatest landslides in presidential history in 1964 uh, to interrupt his duties as leader of the free world, to hie himself to the Secretary of State's office in Manchester to run as a candidate. So he deployed uh, the New Hampshire's Democratic governor and senator to slap together a hasty Johnson writing campaign and predicted McCarthy would only win 11%. The governor of New Hampshire began making absurdly high predictions that McCarthy would get 40%, and that would bring dancing in the streets of Hanoi. Senator McIntyre called McCarthy the candidate of draft dodgers and deserters. That's a liberal Democratic senator. Uh, as American bombers began raining savage raids of reprisal on Buddhist temples in Hue, JFK's legendary speechwriter Richard Goodwin presented himself as a volunteer at McCarthy headquarters. With these two typewriters, he told an intense young campaign secretary, a Chicagoan named Seymour Hirsch, we are going to overthrow the government. OK, so we're going to overthrow the government. Linger on that for a while. It's a joke, of course, but a, but a serious one. Americans aren't supposed to talk about overthrowing the government. The good guys don't do that, right? But there was another quote. For the first time, a large proportion of the country was capable of being convinced that the government had lied to them. The longing for authenticity in a culture of lies. 
Let's pick up the story as the uh, returns are coming in from New Hampshire. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I uh, got my page numbers wrong. So, um, Lyndon Johnson got a very low total. He, his, his standing got a very low total. Uh, Eugene McCarthy got a rather high total, but he didn't win. Uh, Lyndon Johnson joked that New Hampshire is the only place where you can get 40% of the electorate, and they call it a landslide. Uh, but in a sense, it was, right? Uh, Lyndon Johnson had been locked rocked on their heels. The politics of existential authenticity against the culture of lies was getting somewhere. Um, Martin Luther King was shuttling in and out of Memphis in support of the striking garbage workers. Or as the governor of Tennessee put it, training 3,000 people to start riots. The problem with all the um, highlight footage reels of 1968 is they don't talk much about how prevalent the reactionary energies were in society. 500 Tennessee citizens signed a complaint asking for a US district judge uh, to suspend Governor Ellington's frightening plans for National Guard training exercises that would simulate riots in black neighborhoods. Ellington huffed in return, when we say we are going to train the National Guard to protect the lives of people and their property, there's a big hullabaloo about it from people who would like to see riots. A New York Times dispatch on the controversy focused on the fact that one of the 500 petitioners who didn't want the governor to have troops in the streets practicing to fight riots had been arrested once for possessing marijuana. Uh, the next morning, a Saturday, the Saturday after the New Hampshire primary, President Johnson hopped around to the Washington Sheraton Hotel for a breakfast speech to the National Alliance of Businessmen. He all but accused his critics of wanting the other side to win. Early this week in the East Room of the White House, I awarded the Medal of Honor to our, two of our bravest fighting Marines. As your president, I want to say this today, we must meet our commitments to the world in Vietnam. We shall and we are going to win. To meet the needs of these fighting men, we shall do what is required. It was like what John F. Kennedy said in his inaugural address. Pay any price, bear any burden. That afternoon, his worst nightmare came true. Robert F. Kennedy pronounced the exact same phrase his brother had in 1960 in the exact same spot I am announcing today my candidacy for President of the United States. My decision reflects no personal animosity or disrespect towards President Johnson. It is now unmistakably clear that we can change these disastrous divisive policies only by changing the men who are now making them. At stake is not simply the leadership of our party or even our country. It is our right to moral leadership of the planet. But no disrespect intended for <laughs> Allard Lowenstein was enraged, the great existential hero who said he couldn't run because it would make him look like an opportunist, had made his move months too late at a moment of minimum risk, just like the old politicians. All right. Um, there's a Republican side to this story, this idea that politics had become a battle between the honest, the authentic, the organic, and uh, the old politics of hustle and scam. Uh, I have a question for the, uh, the students in the audience. Who here has heard of the name George Romney? <laughs> you might be a student. Uh, George Romney used to be very, very famous. <laughs> Uh, his son ran for president um, in uh, 2008 against Barack Obama. Uh, George Romney was probably for a time definitely the favorite for the Republican nomination. Uh, maybe the favorite to uh, win uh, the 1968 presidency. 
Um, he's a completely forgotten figure. Um, he was the governor of Michigan. On September 4th, 1967, a TV viewer, interviewer asked the Michigan, Michigan governor about Vietnam. Isn't it your position, isn't your position a bit inconsistent with what it was? And what do you propose to do now? The Mormon bishop, who had been once been very supportive of Vietnam, but now criticized it, wearied by months of duck and weave, decided to lay it on the line. When I came back from Vietnam in 1965, I just had the greatest brainwashing that anybody can get when you go over to Vietnam. Not only the generals, but also the diplomatic corps over there, they do a very thorough job. He was improvising, the way the meticulous Richard Nixon, his opponent, never would. Quote, and since returning from Vietnam, I've gone into the history of Vietnam, all the way back to World War II and before that, and as a result, I've changed my mind in that particularly, I no longer believe it necessary for us to get involved in South Vietnam to stop aggression in Southeast Asia and to prevent Chinese communist domination of Southeast Asia. Now, any intelligent observer studying America's history in Vietnam since World War II might come to the same conclusion. The war was not doing, could not do what the government said it was going to do and could do. But that was too complex to hear. What people heard was that word brainwashing. The term brainwashing had come into use after the Korean War to explain why some prisoners of war, supposedly insufficient, insufficiently sturdy in their patriotism to, to resist, chose to stay behind in enemy territory and denounce the United States. It was what the ruthless did to the soft-minded. Neither side of the association appealed to voters. The notion that the architects of the Vietnam War were ruthless and the notion of a soft-minded president. The governor of Oklahoma, the conservative Republican Henry Bellman, had been on the same trip in 1965 and piped up at a Republican National Committee press conference, I believe we are fully and factually informed. There was no indication we were misled or brainwashed in any way. As Romney attempted to clarify, he dug himself in deeper and deeper, and the hometown Detroit News demanded he step aside so his financial backer, Nelson Rockefeller, could enter the race instead. The paper point out that Romney had supported the war publicly for two years after his trip. How long does the brainwashing linger? In the next Harris poll, Romney dropped 16 points. Richard Nixon hadn't seen anything like it in his 20 years in politics. He said one moment he's the front runner, the next moment he's down. Words are so very, very important. Richard Nixon. Um, Richard Nixon officially announced his campaign for president. Uh, 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 at the last possible moment, arriving in New Hampshire on February 2nd. People used to um, start running for president much, much, much later than they do now. He announces his campaign February 2nd for a primary that's on uh, March 15th. The same day, 150,000 letters announcing his run, prepared entirely in secret, arrived at 85% of New Hampshire households. The day went off with Prussian discipline. He arrived in Boston at midnight at a time, tiny out of the way motel that wasn't informed it had a celebrity guest. He got a good night's sleep for his first Manchester press conference in the afternoon when campaign kickoffs traditionally came early in the morning, where he laid down his anti-Romney marker. Only decisive winners of the primary will and should be nominated. He gave his opening speech in the evening, resting in between. The message was tested using the latest survey research techniques. 500 New Hampshire Republicans sat down for long tape-recorded interviews. At the headquarters in New York, the staff poured over the transcripts. It was not a pleasant project. He's a loser. Frankly, I don't think he stands much of a chance. He's always running for something, but never getting there. He should be honest with himself and quit running for things. This is the guy who lost the president's <coughs> presidency race in 1960, and he lost running for governor of California in 1962. Then his aide, Len Garment, found a diamond in the rough. He's proven he can take it. He's been slapped down before, and he can come back. Garment underlined the sentence twice. 
That's it. Here was something they could work with, like Winston Churchill, like Abraham Lincoln, Nixon's the man who came back. That was the message 150,000 New Hampshireites read to, uh, February 2nd. During my 14 years in Washington, I learned the awesome power of the great decisions a president faces. During the past eight years, I've had a chance to reflect on the lessons of public office. I believe I have found some answers. They had spent hours haggling over that word. Believe, hope, or have. Believe, they decided, was the ticket. Not too arrogant, not too diffident. His campaign posters proclaimed, you can't handshake your way out of the kinds of problems we have today. You gotta think them through, and that takes a lifetime of getting ready. They made a virtue of the one thing the jackals of the press would be hammering him for. For Richard Nixon would actually hardly be shaking any hands at all. His opening speech was all shining idealism. America was suffering from a crisis of spirit. The president had lost the soul of the nation. The nation needed leadership to provide the lift of a driving dream. It was followed by a most un-Nixonian function, an open bar reception for the press. The candidates circulated, ham-fistingly slapping backs and telling jokes, then leapt upon a chair for an informal speech. This campaign, he promised, would be the most open he'd ever run. The press corps, <coughs> charmed, composed an impromptu ditty around the bar, the new Nixon, the newest they'd ever seen. First thing the next morning, the candidate slipped out before any reporters or handshake hungry voters could even spot him. For actually, this was going to be the most closed campaign he ever ran. The idea had come of an appearance the previous autumn on Mike Douglas's afternoon TV chat show. As Nixon sat in the Douglas show's makeup chair, he <coughs> chatted perfunctorily with a young producer about how silly it was that it took Gimmicks like going on daytime TV to get elected president. <laughs> the producer, a young 26-year-old named Roger Ailes, did not come back with the expected deferential uh, chuckle. He's the future head of Fox News. He lectured him. If Nixon still thought talk shows were a gimmick, he'd never become president of the United States. Ailes then reeled off a litany of Nixon's TV mistakes in 1960 when he had been in high school. And before Ailes knew it, he'd been whisked to New York and invited to work for the man in charge of the media team. Um, he was a TV producing prodigy. Um, let's see here. Um, with the rest of the media team, they reviewed game field, a game film like football coaches, seven hours of Nixon TV appearances. As a stump speaker, the medium could make him look like an earnest, sweaty litigator. My friends in the law school like that, right? Uh, he did better on camera in informal settings. He could look a questioner in the eye. They decided that this would be how they would make sure Nixon was seen all through 1968. But Richard Nixon had too many enemies. Genuinely impromptu encounters, the sort that was supposed to be the charm of New Hampshire campaigning, had a way of turning nasty. Thus, Roger Ailes' innovation. They would film impromptu encounters only they would be staged. <laughs> so Roger Ailes invented the fake town meeting, right? They'd get people, they'd get Nixon supporters in the audience, they would get very carefully screened people to ask him questions, and then they would chop them up and edit them to make it look like Richard Nixon was stalwartly facing down anyone who had any tough questions. Um, so that's the theme, right? We have this encounter between an elector who longs for a new kind of openness, a new kind of truth, uh, and we have Richard Nixon, who is just completely advancing what it means to be a phony in politics. Um, now we come to the signature of the story, just the hinge of the lecture here, the assassination. Um, we got a great view of what that was like. Martin Luther King was in Memphis to support the Carver strike. He gave an extraordinary address that was famous for a premonition of his own death. He returned to the Lorraine Mattel, was murdered. Estimates of how many riots broke out ranged from 75 to 125. Uh, let me continue by talking about what happened 
at Martin Luther King's funeral. And uh, what happened afterwards? President Johnson declared April 9th a national day of mourning. 200,000 bodies trooped through downtown Atlanta for his funeral. But Georgia's segregationist governor called him an enemy of our country. He holed up in his office with 160 riot-helmeted state troopers for his protection, threatening to personally raise the flags that were at half-mast. Conservatives pronounced that Martin Luther King, with his doctrine of civil disobedience, was responsible for his own murder. Ronald Reagan said that this was just the sort of, quote, great tragedy that began when we began compromising with law and order and people started choosing which laws they break. So in other words, think about the doctrine of civil disobedience. Right? Think about the famous letter from a Birmingham jail. Some laws are so outrageous, we can't possibly, in good conscience, follow them. And this is Ronald Reagan's interpretation of that. Strom Thurmond, the conservative South Carolina senator, wrote his constituents, we are now witnessing the whirlwind so years ago when some preachers and teachers began telling people that each man could be the judge in his own case. Moderates found themselves newborn conservatives. In Maryland, Governor Spiro Agnew bounced back from a political humiliation by calling 100 black civic leaders to the state office building in Annapolis. He lectured them before a battery of TV cameras. Okay. Um, his full detail of state troopers at the ready, uh, the commander of the State National Guard standing attention in a jumpsuit and riding crop. The governor said he made little distinction between the ministers and distinguished urban league officers before him who had been working day and night to prevent rioting, and the circuit riding, Hanoi visiting type of leader, the caterwauling, riot inciting, burn America down type of leader. Many stomped in rage, stomped out in rage. To those who remained, Agnew concluded, the fiction that Negroes lack any opportunity in this country is dis dispelled by the status of those of you in this room. The governor started counting telegrams. 1,250 in approval, 11 opposed. The Chicago Tribune, in an editorial the morning of Martin Luther King's funeral, refused to acknowledge the existence of any racial impasse at all. The murder of Dr. King is a crime and the sin of an individual. The man who committed the act must come to terms with his maker. The rest of us were not contributors to this particular crime. Yes, this nation and people need a day of mourning. But America should mourn because moral values were at their lowest level since the decadence of Rome. Drug addiction among the youth is so widespread that we are treated to the spectacle at great universities of faculty student committees solemnly decreeing that this is no longer a matter for correction. At countless universities, the doors of dormitories are open to mixed company with no supervision. Not here at North, Northeastern, I hope. Dress is immodest, pornography floods the newsstands and bookstores, free speech movements on campus address themselves with four letter words. We are knee deep in hippies, marijuana, LSD, and other hallucinogens. We do not need any of these. We are self doped to the point where our standards are lost. If you are black, so goes the contention, you are right and must be indulged in every wish. Why, break all the windows and make off with the color TV set, the case of liquor, the beer, the dress, the coat, the shoes, we won't shoot you. That would be police brutality. If you are white, you are wrong. If you feel guilty about it, assume the collective guilt of all your progenitors, even if neither you or anyone you know as a descendant of slave owners. Yield the sidewalk to the migrants from the South who have descended on your cities. Honor their every want because the quote unquote liberals tell you that it is your fault that they have not educated themselves, developed responsibility, trained themselves to hold jobs, or are shiftless or dependent, independent on your taxes. Mourn, the Chicago Tribune said, because Martin Luther King had won. All right, let's pause here. A backtrack. Remember the invitation to this lecture series. To think about, quote, the definition of the rule of law, what it requires, and what happens in its absence. I think when I first invoked those words, we all kind of nodded, smiled, and said to ourselves, 
yeah, rule of law, we're for that, right? It's a good thing. But what happens in its absence is a bad thing. Well, the Chicago Tribune, Ronald Reagan and Strom Thurmond certainly agree. Rule of law. Martin Luther King disagreed. His whole career was about saying we have to have the courage to defy unjust laws, to be lawless in the service of a higher law. Let's fast forward to August. We have, saw the images I'm going to be talking about. Thanks to the rules governing the Democratic Party, thanks, you might say, to the rule of law, uh, one that the party completely decided to overturn in the next few years, the insurgency that forced Lyndon Johnson to quit turns out to be almost completely irrelevant to the decision of who would be the party's nominee. At the convention in Chicago, it almost certainly would be Lyndon Johnson's hand-picked successor, Hubert Humphrey, even though he hasn't entered, let alone won, a single primary. That's the rule. The only way the insurgents will have to register their dissent is a vote over whether to have a pro-war or an anti-war plank that defeat from the previous year, which they lose because the rule of law prevails. It also does in the streets of Chicago. Let me take you a little bit inside the story and Chicago is planning uh, its convention. This will be my last, uh, my last point from 1968. Two separate groups were organizing independently and at cross purposes to protest at the convention. The first insisted that they were neither a group nor organizing at all, that their leaders weren't anything like leaders. Uh, that was Jeb, Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman. Uh, Rubin was from Cincinnati. His favorite uncle was a vaudeville performer. Uh, he started out as a labor organizer like his father. Later, he moved to Berkeley and decided politics was most ra radical when it resembled vaudeville. It was Jerry Ruman who came up with the idea to allow armament shipments, uh, to follow, I'm sorry, arm shipments in a government pickup truck, displaying a flashing yellow sign reading, Danger, Napalm Ahead. It was Jerry's idea to throw wanted for war crimes flyers in the face of General Maxwell Taylor. It was Jerry who testified in full Revolutionary War regalia when called before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Drugs completed the transformation. I began to see that we had to create a movement that was an end in itself, not an external goal or a revolution, but living the revolution every day. One morning at the New York Stock Exchange with his new best friend, Abby Hoffman, who led the levitation of the Pentagon, they dropped money from the gallery to the trailing trading floor below, floor below, the resulting greedy malay made the evening newscasts. Abby Hoffman liked to say, I fight through the jungles of TV. Uh, that was Roger Hale's watchword too. They planned rock concerts, a be-in, a happening. Kate Ashbury in the streets of Chicago. They called their unorganizable organizing body the Youth International Party, YIP. Yippee. They held a press conference the day RFK entered the presidential race. We will create for our own reality. We will not accept the false theater of the death convention. Everything we do is going to be sent out to living rooms from India to the Soviet Union to every small town in America. It's a real opportunity to make clear the two Americas. We're confront at the same time we're confronting them, we're offering our alternative way of life. The other faction planning for Chicago, the National Mobilization Committee to End the War in Vietnam, resembled military tacticians. One architect, Tom Hayden, had, taken, uh, had helped take over a building at Columbia, but he was also a movement, the movement's inside man. It's Slickus operative who had met with Avril Harriman and traveled to Panoy to negotiate for the release of prisoners of war. Um, the, uh, oh wait, here's the, their advisor, David Dellinger, was a pacifist who had gone to jail rather than submit to a seminar's draft, seminary and draft deferment in World War II. He was a wasp who wore tweed and had graduated from Yale. Abby thought that they were the establishment's twins. They understand each other. They all wear suits and ties, they sit down, they talk rationally, they use all the same kinds of words. They're men suffering from menopause. Very sexist stuff, by the way. Uh, but the Moe was no less interested in their yippie brethren in spectacles. 
uh, Randy Davis, one of their leaders, brought an American fragmentation bomb to North Vietnam with him, remember where he went. Uh, in 1967, living in Newark as a community organizer, Hayden wrote, riots must be viewed both as a new stage in the development of Negro protest against racism and a logical outgrowth of the failure of the whole society to support racial equality. Uh, a third faction was coming to the convention, the McCarthy kids, the come clean for Jean people. They were gonna demonstrate in the streets for an anti-war re resolution for the convention to pressure the cigar chompers in the back rooms to let delegates pass their consciousness. Yeah. Uh, but most McCarthy kids have long ago made other plans. Their coalition for an open convention dissolved, fearing violent malaise in the streets of Chicago which meant those finally coming to Chicago would be the most militant and those who welcomed confrontation. The city of Chicago had its own definition of the word open. It had to do with the definition of other words. No one is gonna take over our city, Mayor Daley announced. We'll permit them to act as American citizens in no other way. A citizen was someone who was orderly, obedient, who followed the rules. Anyone else in his Argo was an outsider, a bad guy. The most fateful decision for the Democrats was made the Thursday prior to their convention, not by a politician, but by a federal district judge, William Lynch, Mayor Daley's former law partner. He withheld marching permits for the Vogue and sleeping permits for the Yippies. Mayor Daley's please reaction was recorded in a Tribune article headlined daily blast suppression of the Czechs. The Soviet Union was fighting back against uh, an uprising in Czechoslovakia as this was, as this was happening. We don't permit our people to sleep in the park, so why should we let anyone from outside the city sleep in the park? We don't permit our own people to march at night, so why should we let a lot of people do snake dances at night through the neighborhoods? Law and order the rule of law. Thursday night at 11 p.m. in Lincoln Park, which is where the Yippies were having their festival of life, the same thing happened that had been happening at 11 o'clock every night. Obediently, the drum circle broke up, the political bull session ceased, guitars were returning to cases litter bagged and packed out. The protesters had shown goodwill against the glaring stares of the blue-shirted police in the expectation that the 11 p.m. curfew would eventually be suspended, even though they felt like they'd been double crossed. The Moe was denied their parade permit. The Monday night of the convention, when 11 o'clock came, the Yippies decided they were gonna stay. The police beat them up. They thronged into the streets, started chanting, the whole world is watching, the whole world is watching. Thursday night at the convention, when they had to vote on the plank, whether to support or oppose the Vietnam War, which lost because the forces of William Daley basically had rigged the vote, had kicked people out who were leading, who allowed demonstrations on one side and not the other. Uh, they decided they would march from downtown, if you know Chicago, at Michigan and Balbo, to the south side where the arena was. The police blocked them. They decided to sit down in the street. tear gas into the paddy wagons, and then they would shut the doors to paddy wagons and take people off to, uh, to, um, to jail. Rule of law. They were breaking the law. Um, one more couple page reading. Uh, it's about this confrontation between who is the upholder of the rule of law. <laughs> 
The network views divisions, the men who ran them, prided themselves as an oasis in the vast wasteland. Uh, NBC, with its flagship evening show, The Huntley Brinkley Report, was the most morally self-assured. They had a young producer out of Chicago named Luke Cook, whose specialty was covering the civil rights and anti-war movements. They turned to him the previous January when they wanted to know whether there would be violence at the Democratic Convention. Knowing the parties involved, he said, absolutely. During convention week, Cook, Cook had led the teams that went to the streets and parks to capture the footage of the violence. He was inordinately proud of what he had produced. 1968 version of Bull Connor's Fire Hoses, a glorious moral theater, naked evil being visited upon innocent. He repaired to NBC headquarters in the merchandise mark after that first broadcast, filled with self-satisfaction. A sympathizer with the anti-war movement, he thought he had advanced the cause considerably. The assignment editor asked him to help with the phones because the switchboard was overwhelmed. The first call. I saw the cops beating those kids right on for the cops. Another. You fucking commies. He was referring to NBC as if they had instigated the riots, a common theory. The calls kept coming. Dozens that came from the net all the, for all the networks for days upon days. Some people saw noble cops innocently defending themselves. Others saw the networks hiring cops to beat up kids to spice up the show. Lou Cook was so shaken by the experience, he left for a soul-searching six-month leave of absence. The Daily News in Chicago had devoted an entire page on August 29th to a set of pictures documenting a circle of cops and an off-duty armed paratrooper beating one of their photographers even after he pulled out his press card. He was wearing a helmet, they pulled it off. They kept on going until they'd broken bones. The news was a liberal paper, kind of editorialized high-mindedly that the International Amphitheater, dressed up and fortified, lies in the shadow of one of the world's worst slums in the nation. They turned their letter section over to the debate over the convention violence. Some supported the paper's position. They wrote things like, when I was with the Marines, I thought I was fighting for democracy, but now I come home to find a police state as bad as the communists. He supported the rule of law. They said things like, we need to establish immediately a humane society for the prevention of cruelty for our finest people who are still human enough to protest the wholesale killing of wonderful people in the name of patriotism by a nation of moral imbeciles. Many more, however, converged upon another narrative. The major television networks have shown a completely one-sided story of what happened. The Yippies and McCarthy people were not just throwing beer cans and ashtrays at the police and National Guard, they were throwing plastic bags of excrement from the 15th floor. They insulted the police with words that can't be printed and wrote the same words on their foreheads. The Chicago police reacted, reacted as any police force in the country would have. I failed to see reports of lewd activities, vile provocations, or violence committed by the degenerates who invaded our city. We are amazed and angry at the shameful lashing our city and our mayor have been subjected to because of the events of last week. Much of this undeserved criticism is the result of the distorted presentations of the events by the television, by the newspaper, and by the radio. My neighbor is a Chicago policeman, one of those assigned to protect the Hilton Hotel from mob invasion. On Monday and Tuesday, he worked 16 hours straight. I met him coming home Thursday morning. He was covered with human excrement thrown on him by the mob. Hard-nosed Chicago newsmen pointed out that these were obviously just so stories. A cop had to return to the station house after a shift. He didn't change his clothes. He drives back with his wife, with his wife and children still covered with the same feces. The narrative came from the Chicago city government. Mayor Daly proclaimed on August 29th in a appearance in today's show, the television industry is part of the violence and is creating it all over the country. What would you do if someone was throwing human excrement in your face? Would you be calm, collected people? Bumper stickers proliferated nationwide. We support Mayor Daley and the Chicago police. 60% of Americans polled supported the sentiment, and 90% of the 74,000 letters City Hall received in the mail in the two weeks after the convention supported it. It wasn't, they said, their children beaten in the streets in Chicago. And these media mandarins, they said, 
inform their moral authorities. Thanks. So we want to focus as much as possible on uh, the uh, takeaways from uh, 68 as they related to uh, the uh, use or misuse of the rule of law then and the use or misuse um, of the rule of law uh, today. Um, and, and I'll just comment that it, it does strike me that in 68 there were a significant number of lawyers um, and legislators who were presumably familiar with the rule of law at that time. Um, I, having lived uh, through that, knew that um, many of us who uh, were either in law or thinking about law were very conscious uh, when we went to the Pentagon, for example, uh, where I was, but not part of the little levitating group, um, or when we went out on uh, other kinds of marches and demonstrations, that in fact, uh, we were seeking to challenge the uh, laws as they existed, the rule of laws that was being applied, um, and the uh, status quo. Uh, in terms of the structure of law at that time. And so I wonder uh, what the implications of the, the confrontation between uh, folks who were on both sides of the rule of law at that point were as they are takeaways at this moment. But I'm not going to ask you to answer that. I, I, I pose that as a question. I have a great answer. Um, you'll get to answer that as uh, folks uh, uh, from our uh, classroom audience get to jump in and to raise questions or make comments. So, um, comments, yes. So, um, as somebody who was arrested at the Pentagon in 1970, I uh, went to the Georgetown jail. Um, I, I once heard that period referred to as a bitter and contentious time, which makes me think about now. But I wonder if you could speak to all the other things that were going on, which was women's rights, desegregation, um, uh, the riots that you talked about, um, rock and roll, uh, all of the dissension about the draft, the assassinations, the sexual resolution. A lot of the drugs were coming back from Vietnam. Um, and so I would ask you to talk about all of the other things that were up in the air in terms of all the things that had been taken for granted by the generation that came out of World War II. Let me, let me, um, uh, I gotta, I get the microphone. Oh. Let me, let me start with uh, Ted's question about um, uh, what does it mean to be, it, it kind of gets, it gets to the, the, the marrow of what does it mean to be for the rule of law. Um, of course, it's zillions, it's the page after page here, I just have so many stories and I think I just you know like loaded up too many and only used half of the ones I intended to. Um, but two things come to mind when it comes to that question. First is from 1968, and the second is from 1973. Actually, the first more kind of like 1966 period, which is a really great year, by the way. No one has conferences on that one. Um, the Black Panther started late in 1966. Uh, they were uh, Huey Newton and. Um, and Bobby Seale were, were college students at Mary, Mary College in Oakland. And very, very uh, parallel to um, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, in that the ex obsessive focus of the Black Panthers when they began was the police force as an occupying army in black neighborhoods. Uh, and that's why it grew and thrived so quickly. But one of the fascinating things about the Black Panthers to me is in that early period, 1966 and 1967, uh, they carried guns and they carried law books. And when uh, a cop would say, why are you carrying that gun? They would say, why are you carrying your gun? And they would pull out their law book and say, look here, it says we're allowed to um, carry uh, uh, unchambered weapons in our cars. Uh, in the most famous confrontation of the early Black Panthers early in 1967, uh, they marched into the California legislature when it was in session carrying unloaded weapons uh, because the law allowed them to. And 
guess what the, the state legislature did, led by Ronald Reagan, who was the governor then? They changed the law. So law is an important thing, right? The fascinating thing is um, the forces of gun control at that time were largely coming from uh, conservatives who were fighting at the black fighting back against the Black Panthers who said we are allowed to carry guns to defend ourselves. Uh, and that sort of faith, that the kind of like strange kind of liberalism of the Black Panthers, this is what the law says, this is the letter of the law, is fascinating, right? It, 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 the most radical group kind of working to uh, maybe with a little bit of what we call not called trolling, right? Uh, but the sense that like the whole law allows this, and the cops are breaking the law in the following ways. Right, and, and it should also be remembered that the uh, Black Panther Party at that time was, uh, whether they're, they were in uh, Oakland or Brooklyn or in other parts of the country, uh, running health clinics, uh, food pantries, uh, uh, educational programs for kids, literacy programs and the like, and as much as the uh, press seized upon the uh, a very public activity uh, that uh, surrounded their carrying arms, uh, the group was also uh, actively engaged in community organizing um, and voting and a range of other uh, much more boring activities that didn't read as well uh, on, on the uh, 6 o'clock news. Well, you could say that certainly by you know, the later 60s, 1970, and then 1974, when a bunch of them ran for office in Oakland, yeah, they were trying to create like a parallel government structure, a parallel rule of law. Um, the thoughts that came to mind from the audience member's question is, um, 1968 was also the same year, it was in August, that um, uh, feminists marched on the boardwalk in uh, Atlantic City during the Miss America pageant. They intended to, um, throw a bunch of the, basically um, uh, detritus from of women's oppression, including bras, but also secretarial equipment and things like that, into what they called a freedom trash can and set it on fire. But they couldn't get a permit. <laughs> Again, they followed the law. And uh, be, but because they talked about uh, burning bras in a freedom trash can, that became the media's shorthand for what these crazy feminists were up to. They all wanted to burn their bras. It was a great way to kind of dismiss the seriousness of the feminist movement. Um, let me round up the other things you mentioned in a big theoretical point. Uh, rock, draft resistance, sex, uh, all the drugs that were coming back from Vietnam. Um, so there was a huge heroin problem among Vietnam War soldiers. You could smoke uh, heroin and it didn't make a smell. So they would roll into cigarettes. They said you could salute your uh, commander with one hand and smoke heroin with the other hand. Um, so the thing that ties all this together and a lot of this stuff together in this quest for radical authenticity was an economic context in which following World War II and uh, following before, back before World War II, uh, uh, the Depression and the New Deal, America experienced an economic boom a broadly shared middle class prosperity that no society on earth had ever achieved. Now, of course, it wasn't widely shared enough, and there were still pockets of poverty, and there was, you know, like a crisis of African American unemployment, but there was a colossal amount of uh, growth, and um, to the extent never before conceivable, someone could get a high school degree or even drop out of high school and get a job at a factory and you know, <laughs> retire with a big fat pension uh, and get a vacation home and really kind of the world that the World War II prosperity, post-World War II prosperity created was the first world mass middle class. And the children of that mass middle class uh, who had been, been reared in a kind of ease and prosperity unlike any of the world had ever seen were saddled with parents who had gone through the Depression and gone through World War II and their defining experience was one of scarcity and one of limits. And that's how they raised their children. The kids who were doing all this crazy stuff, uh, not only drugs, but you know, protesting against the very structures of society itself, um, 
were um, uh, doing so in rebellion against limits, a sense of social limits that seemed no longer relevant in a society in which scarcity was no longer even conceivable. Not only was the American economy just dynamic in, in a way like no economy had ever been, it seemed like it was going to be that way forever. That economists had figured out how to, how to uh, manage the cycles of supply and demand, uh, that like Keynesian econ economics could turn off growth uh, when infl inflation you know, threatened, like, like turning off a spigot. And so you know, it, was, it was often pointed out, why not live on food stamps in, in, in Ashbury? Because this society is so plentiful, we don't even need to work anymore. Right, as soon as we understand that the majority of, of uh, folks who were involved um, in that uh, prosperity were um, white and male. Absolutely. Uh, women were excluded, people of color were excluded. Uh, there was a parallel women's movement, there was certainly a parallel civil rights and black movement. Um, and, and often there was very little overlap um, as among those movements. I mean, when you look at the video, for example, you, yeah. You don't see a whole lot of women and people of color who are uh, uh, in, in uh, the leadership um, or even in the, the masses of the individuals who are being involved. And the other thing that we haven't mentioned is the draft. Um, much of uh, the reaction against uh, uh, the war uh, emerged from the fact that a lot of those middle class, uh, presumably comfortable kids uh, in college were being subjected to being sent away to be killed. And they were coming home dead. Uh, and, and that had a profound impact on that generation that came of age in, in 68. But let's open up to other folks. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the connection. I'm not a lawyer, so forgive the question if it's really basic. But um, you know, the rule of law um, is not static, right? It's negotiated. Um, and I just wonder to what degree um, this point of affluence and ability to uh, push the limits and therefore open uh, the rule of law to negotiation and uh, navigate new parameters for it um, could be parallel to today. And how, how do we compare the level of affluence? I mean, the point of people of color and women not benefiting from the 60s, the 50s, and 60s, and 70s, and we see this enormous inequality in the country now, right? Um, and yet it feels to me, um, as a member of the society, that we don't have the bravery or the courage to push the rule of law. That actually, yeah. That's, yeah. that's my question. That's a quick, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to Wendy, but a point, a quick point I had about that one was, um, one of the things that theorists of uh, sociologists of protest movements notice is that they often don't happen among populations that are at their kind of nadir in terms of uh, hopelessness or uh, economic uh, 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 strife. Uh, that they often come in times of raising of of of, of, um, of heightened expectation uh, and. Uh, because people s look around them and say, I can protest without fear of losing everything, right? Like you could, you could burn down a building, you know, if you were in college and get a job at you know, IBM the next month if you wanted to, because there are so many jobs to be had. Whereas people are often feeling too deprived to risk that sort of kind of negotiation and pushback against the law. Um, so, uh, you know, you often saw um, riots in communities that really baffled, baffled people like Lyndon Johnson when they looked at Watts, where the first riot was in 1965, and said, wow, these people have nice little bungalows with lawns. It doesn't look like you know, a slum you know, in Harlem. right? So they call that a, ri a revolution in rising expectations. Uh, and you see that, for example, uh, the people who were involved in the Iranian Revolution in 1978 and 79 were this newly empowered middle class who went to the West. right? But maybe they have a little bit broader uh, perspective and are able to see, you know, uh, not the worm's eye view, but maybe a broader view of the possibilities and, and the inequalities. Wendy, rule of law. Uh, well, this is less a comment on the rule of law than the economic situation, but I just think it's interesting for those of us who were here last week's conversation about 
thinking about the tensions that came and that threatened the rule of law from increasing economic um, inequality and from economic sort of stagnation. So our speakers last week were talking about how, you know, sort of the roots of polarization today mm -hmm. and threats to the rule of law that come from that as coming from the loss of the great prosperity right. of the post-war World War II period. And now I think you're really helping us to see, well, there's a little bit more complex, there's, there's additional complexity to this economic story, of course, because 1968 was not the year of, you know, the diminishing economic um, prospects. Um, it was, of course, still in that period of post-war, and yet there is that significant tension. Um, but I don't know whether the difference between then and now is, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is, you know, both periods heightened polarization, mm -hmm. um, intense divisiveness, right. right, that sense of cultural and, and people using language of rule of law sometimes um, in, in different and incendiary ways and that appeal to order, and yet we haven't seen the violence that we have in 1968 in the broad, in the, in the, that we right. saw in the 60s, in, in the kind, with the kind of breath that we did in the 60s. I mean, I think Ted, Ted pointed a huge part of the reason. If, if, if my premise is that one of the reasons 1968 and its surrounding for number were so traumatic to Americans, it was precisely the sense that the rule of law was being centered in a way that was completely fresh to a lot of Americans, a lot of white Americans, who believed so innately in the goodness of America. And in the case of young people going off to war and coming back in body bags, right, uh, it was just the law seemed so fundamentally unjust and corrupt. And the draft was so fundamentally unjust and corrupt. The way you could get out of the war was you know, get an orthodontist, you know, to like sign a note saying you were, you were, you know, whatever. Or, 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 uh, you know, Dick Cheney, you know, got deferment after deferment because he, he said you, you know, were pursuing higher education, you know, you could get out of the draft. And there was a very fascinating article that came out in the late 70s that was just very galvanizing and soul searing for a lot of veterans of the anti war movement saying, what did you do in the class war, daddy? And it started with the story of um, uh, two groups of Bostonians, one from Dorchester or Southie, uh, who, who were bused into the draft center, and one from Cambridge, and they were all student, MIT students, MIT students, Harvard students, and the kids from Harvard all had their you know, doctor's notes, and their, you know, they knew how to claim that they were gay, and all this other stuff. And the kids from Southie were like, all right, here we are, you know. Uh, and, and one of the, the guy who wrote this uh, article, young then, but now a kind of a uh, uh, eminent squeeze of journalism, James Fallows, pointed out that um, a lot of people by um, refusing uh, to go to Vietnam uh, and just saying, well, of course I oppose this war, but I'm gonna go out of a sense of duty, were sending off young, poor minority people to die. So that's an added layer of uh, complexity. Let me ask, a, uh, let me ask a, a, or pose a, a related issue, and that is that um, at this moment we've got um, in the United States the uh, lowest uh, unemployment levels that we've had in a decade. The news coming out of Wall Street today notwithstanding. Um, and, um, Many of us view the law and, and the rule of law as uh, being premised in an effort to get to uh, the truth right. um, of, of the world around us and to bring some order to the world around us through uh, some shared sense of what the truth is. Right. Um, we also all seem to understand that we are surrounded by more public lies um, and hypocrisy around truth than we've probably encountered ever uh, within the context of this democracy. So why is it that in this period of 
of uh, prosperity, which was the case in the 60s, uh, when uh, people rose up to challenge the then concept of the rule of law. Why are we so complacent now? Well, and, and what is the takeaway from what happened then vis-a-vis -vis what doesn't seem to be happening now uh, around that challenge to the lack of truth that comes from our lawmakers? Right. Um, I mean, on the question of uh, prosperity, um, a lot of it is the nature of prosperity. Uh, the American political economy, society, culture, for all its flaws in the 50s and 60s, created largely through the strength of the union movement, a shared prosperity that is extremely foreign to our current extremely unequal economy. It's like the old joke, you know, uh, uh, about how average, uh, average uh, incomes were. You know, nine guys, nine broke guys are in a bar, and Bill Gates walks in and they say, I'm a millionaire, because on average, you know, the, it's, you know, whatever, every person in the bar averages $100 million, right? Um, people um, have jobs, you know, but they don't have benefits, right? They have jobs, but they don't have job security. So the sense of, uh, of um, de feeling deprived even in the midst of prosperity when there's so much, um, uh, shall we say, uh, um, rent seeking and kind of windfall taking on the part of not just the 1% but the 0.1% uh, creates um, a sense of desperation which makes it very hard to um, resist because you have to have a sense that you can um, put your living at risk and land on your feet. Dean Paul, are you going to make a comment on this? Well, I was going to ask a question. So, so for those who have not read it, uh, our, our guest has a piece in today's uh, New York Times uh, about how it's now possible technologically to make films so that it looks like you take any person that you want and create a film and make have them say anything that you want. Uh, and then you can post it on the, uh, on the internet and by the time they're done denying that they said it, the recollection of them saying it. Or, so, so this is a perfect example of how difficult it is to hold on to any kind of truth. So I took the theme of your talk to be that the rule of law is something claimed by many sides in the same political dispute. So Bobby Kennedy was, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, was talking about, we don't want lawlessness and I'm for the rule of law. And the Mayor Daley and his team was a rule of law, and Nixon and his team uh, were for the rule of law. So given that that's the case, the challenge for the citizens is to try to figure out, well, if everybody is claiming that, what are we looking for to say, well, they're, they're claiming this, but no, that's not really what, what they're about. And the, you know, the, the conclusion to your story, or the 68 story, was eventually people figured out that Nixon was using the rule of law purely for personal, and, and the system rallied, and he was expelled. Now, in the absence of neutral media or anything, what are we going to do? How is it, as are, are we going to react so that we can observe, and I'm not trying to be partisan here, but observe when any, any particular leader is claiming to be for the rule of law, but then, let's say, is attacking the FBI and why are they doing that? How, how do we figure all that out? Well, I can't solve that problem, <laughs> but I can observe that it's very interesting uh, that a lot of, uh, I would say, the bad actors within not just our national system, but our international system um, are not necessarily claiming to um, uphold the rule of law, right? I mean, two figures that come to mind, one is Vladimir Putin, right? And the whole sort of uh, modus operandi of, um, you know, the kind of kleptocracy that runs Russia is that well we're all wised up and we know that it's a tough world out there and really uh, the, the, the you know like um, sure we're you know we cut lots of corners uh, and you know we're not a fair and equal society but you know look at the West they're not fair and equal either right so so much of what they do is based on just uh, asking the citizen to just kind of throw their hands up in the air and say I, I don't know, I don't know I don't know who's right right so that's that's very different from claiming you know and even in, in, in a sort of kind of classic fascist mode, 
you know, uh, having jurists saying, you know, we are basically uh, a system of order and law, but it's almost like uh, uh, distracting people with uh, a miasma of chaos while they kind of do all the grabbing, right? And Donald Trump is the same way. I mean, look at um, one of his most you know, famous performances in one of the debates, and he says, well, I'm the guy can, that can tell what's corruption because after all, I've bribed all these guys. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's, he's and, 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 you know, I'm sure, I mean, he, he claims he's innocent and he didn't collude with anyone, but, you know, he's, he's, um, he's not really, um, his rhetoric, his, 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 the rhetoric by which he defends himself is not really rooted in uh, so much a claim of kind of high-minded legalism or proceduralism, but, um, well, they're just as bad, you know? You think I colluded? Look at how she colluded. Yeah, that's not really a rule of law discourse. Can I ask a question, though, because I think I took during your really interesting talk, you know, trying to get us to think again about the rule of law, because you were, in, to some extent, equating, you know, Nixon's language, Daly's language, ruled by law, something right. equivalent, law and order. Right. And I think your more recent comment just now about Trump suggests something that we, and we had a class a couple weeks ago when we talked about um, the rule, rule by law in non-liberal societies and we looked at the past. So is there a distinction between right. rule of law and rule by law and law and order? And these are concepts that we all toss around, but maybe yeah. it's useful to Law and order is a really interesting them. slogan in that, you know, I mean, uh, people who claim law and order do not tend to be legalistic people, right? Uh, I mean, it was really interesting to see George Wallace in that TV commercial uh, say, we're going to do everything we can within the law to, uh, to, 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 you know, bury these people under the jail and, you know, whatever. Uh, but this is also a guy who would at speeches say, you know, someone had laid down in front of McNamara's limousine. And he said, next person who runs, in, you know, lays in front of my limousine, that's going to be the last day they see, you know. And then you have someone like um, Frank Rizzo, who was the very, uh, he was the quote unquote law and order mayor of Philadelphia in the 1970s, who of course was completely corrupt and nearly went to jail, right. Uh, but also, um, uh, he, he had this amazing quote about the Black Panthers. He said, we're going to string them up within the law, of course. <laughs> right. uh, so yeah, so law and order is kind of like on the pole of, I mean, it's like a very high degree of bullshit and you reach for your gun when you hear someone say it. Um, rule of law, right, uh, this kind of the liberal order. We have statute books, we have this um, justiciability and all these kind of things um, is on kind of the other pole. Um, Rule by law is a little more complicated because, yeah, I guess you're talking about the people who constitutionally have authority over us, but then you have someone, I don't know, I'm just kind of, kind of spitballing here, but you have George W. Bush saying, all right, you clever lawyers, you know, uh, figure out a way to interpret this statute so I can write a legal memo that allows me to torture people in a way that violates international law, right? So there's all kinds of games that politicians can kind of uh, play with the concept of, of uh, law. And I was I was mentioning to 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 my host that uh, you know I'm gonna, I'm gonna end up in 1973. I kind of foreshadowed that here uh, when Richard Nixon, the candidate of Law and Order, right, was revealed to be a criminal um, uh, every day on nightly TV, and then when um, they finally had uh, televised hearings in which the whole country was just absolutely riveted to this hearing table in Washington in a Senate chamber uh, in which day after day after day, highly legalistic discussions and very complicated legal discussions went on, and I'm talking about the Senate Watergate hearings, um, it was pointed out that a lot of the people who kind of came from that kind of 60s insurgent energy in which kind of radical truth and honesty uh, was the guiding value became lawyers, right? A lot of them became lawyers um, uh, during the 60s and early 70s. Applications to law school skyrocketed, and no one wanted to go into corporate law. They all wanted to be crusaders and work for Ralph Nader or the Watergate Committee. But these lawyers, who could see the background whispering into the ears of the senators, they all had long hair. They all had sideburns. And the guys at the witness table, 
the law and order guys, the guys who are supposed to be upholding our values, but turned out to be talking like mafia figures and talking about how they pass bags to each other, you know, at over freeway overpasses to, to pay off burglars, they all had crew cuts, right? Um, so that became a very live question. And then you got to the issue of the state itself as lawless. You had the, um, the hearings on the CIA and the FBI in 1975, the Church and Pike Committee hearings, in which the CIA was you know, basically determined to have illegally assassinated foreign leaders, uh, that, that J. Edgar Hoover, the you know, great law and order hero, had, had, um, had spied on Martin Luther King and created a dossier meant to uh, get him to commit suicide and, and had behaved in you know, um, ways that were quite literally illegal, lawless, and then you had people like the um, people who broke into the FBI facility in Media, Pennsylvania, who uh, discovered all this stuff, quote unquote, breaking the law in the interest of upholding the law. And then you had someone like Daniel Ellsberg. The Post is a wonderful movie that everyone should see. Uh, and it's all about um, Daniel Ellsberg. Not only did he um, uh, illegally uh, uh, release the Pentagon Papers to the media and was willing to go to jail for it, he also, and this is his most recent book, had been a nuclear war planner, and he was also intending to release thousands of pages of top secret government documents about nuclear war, and he has said that he, would, he was willing to go to jail for the rest of his life to uphold some higher law. So we're, we're at the hour, but I can't help but um, add the footnote that um, being in New Haven during that period mm -hmm. um, and, and having had the opportunity to um, uh, listen to Dave Dellinger uh, and Tom Hayden uh, and the Reverend William Sloan Coffin, uh, but also uh, representatives of, of the right uh, coming through uh, was certainly for me a great pleasure for one reason, and that was that all of the discussions circled around uh, the questions and issues of what the law was, uh, what laws uh, were most applicable to uh, the kinds of ethical lives that we thought we might be living moving forward, um, and at what point we um, had a right to challenge uh, laws as they were then being applied, and in what ways. Um, and uh, it, it was that discussion that uh, encouraged many of us to go to law school, but it was the same discussion um, that encouraged many of us to go to the Pentagon uh, or to Washington, uh, not only around um, uh, issues of the war, but also around um, uh, civil rights and women's rights and uh, communities' rights and voting rights and a range of other things that ultimately ended up translating into the uh, passage of a number of laws which um, uh, presumably protect rights at this moment. Um, and to that extent, um, I would just close by urging everyone to take a look at the court ruling uh, that came down today uh, from the Supreme Court uh, covering uh, gerrymandering uh, of electoral districts in uh, Pennsylvania, and it came down from one of the most conservative members um, of the court, and I think that uh, when we get together in another week and a half, um, we'll have a few things to talk about in terms of uh, where this Supreme Court um, stands in terms of uh, the electoral process, uh, the protection of rights, uh, states' rights, um, and uh, where the courts stand vis-a-vis -vis, uh, legislative and executive action at this point. Uh, we'll meet again um, here in a week and a half, um, and uh, I want to thank our uh, guest speaker.